I just want to um, uh, wish uh, everyone a good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alan Levinson. I'm the Schusterman Josie Chair of Jewish History. And on behalf of uh, Professor Yael Lavender Smith, who teaches in Price Business College, uh, we wanted to welcome you to the first of four presidential dream course lectures connected to our class, The Artist Bible. Um, before introducing Professor Lynn Jacobs, uh, today's speaker, uh, I have a, just a few thanks I want to um, utter, utter and first first and, and foremost to uh, uh, Trice Hyman, who is our um, exceptionally able uh, administrative support specialist. Uh, he coordinated uh, all of the visits and in this case had to uncoordinate um, a few of the details as well. Uh, which uh, is uh, above and beyond, but that's sort of what we expect from him. I want to thank uh, our uh, history department chair, Alyssa Faison, and uh, deans David Robel uh, and uh, Corey Phelps uh, for their support uh, for Yael and I to team teach this class. Uh, I want to also thank the uh, president and provost's office uh, for their support of this and actually every presidential dream course for close to 20 years now. I, the second one I've been lucky enough to teach and it's, um, it's just such a great thing to be able to offer our students expertise beyond our own uh, limited abilities. And um, I, I, finally, um, I wanna really uh, uh, thank uh, our uh, partners uh, at the Fred Jones uh, Museum of Art, uh, who uh, it's just been an absolute pleasure to work uh, with them. And uh, Amanda and Hadley, we will see you uh, in person sooner, uh, though not today. Uh, and uh, that's really, uh, uh, that's those are, those are mainly my thank yous. I would like to, um, just uh, urge you when we get to the Q&A, please keep your cues concise and let Professor Jacobs provide the A's. Uh, so uh, she's the star today. Uh, and so with that, uh, 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 Professor uh, Lynn Jacobs uh, is Distinguished Professor of Art History at the University of Arkansas, uh, a specialist in the art of the 15th and 16th century Northern Europe, uh, she's the author of four books and numerous articles, uh, one of which, The Marketing and Standardization of South Netherlandish Carved Altarpieces, uh, won the Art Bulletin's Arthur Kingsley Porter Prize. Professor Jacobs has won two, count them, two, NEH Fellowships, a Day A A Day Research Grant, and the Charles and Nadine Baum Faculty Teaching Award. Uh, as our students discovered this morning, what I had heard uh, through the grapevine. Uh, she's also a wonderful teacher, full of uh, wit and wisdom. So I think without any further ado, uh, I'll just ask everybody to, uh, for during, the, during uh, Professor Jacob's um, lecture to mute yourselves and then when we get to the question and answers, uh, you can put them in the chat and I'll, uh, help navigate, or you can just stick your little yellow uh, uh, animatronic hand up and Professor Jacobs will call on you. So, uh, uh, Professor Jacobs, please. Well, um, thank you very much, Professor Levinson, and, and thank you all for coming this evening. I hope you're all warm and safe, and I just want to also thank Trice for working everything out, and sorry for the cancellations that you had to do as well. I'm, he was just fantastic and organizing everything. Um, I also want to say how much I enjoyed um, the class this morning and how great the students were and willing to participate, even though they'd never seen or heard from me before and they had to work uh, over Zoom and it was a really fun class. Um, I enjoyed it greatly. So as you know, I came here in connection with the Artist Bible class and in my relatively long by now career, 
uh, I've worked on many forms of art in which biblical subject matter has, has come into play, but probably none so much ha has proliferated to the degree in which it did in the works of art, which were the focus of my dissertation and my first book, uh, which was published in 1998. And I know exactly how many years that was because it was also the same year that my son and my only child was born. So he's 24 now. So it was a while ago, quite a while ago. So, you know, several decades, two and a half decades ago. But recently I came back to that material for a number of reasons. I was invited to speak about it. People actually probably didn't realize I hadn't been thinking about it for two and a half decades. But I started thinking about it again, and I kind of came back to that material with a fresh eye. And it turned out that I was able to kind of rethink and come to some new ideas about some of the things that I hadn't been able to resolve when I was working on it as a graduate student. And also when I reworked that for my first book, which is kind of required in our field, it's usually have to do that. So I'm going to pre present some of the material related to that to you tonight, related to some of the new ideas that I had after not thinking about it for 20, 20 so years. So let me see if I can share this screen. Okay. My topic for tonight is biblical narrative and interiority in early Netherlandish carved altarpieces. When I started this topic, which was back in 1981, Nobody outside of Belgium had really worked much on this material. They were very, very obscure. And since then, they've come into a lot, a lot more people know about them. They're still relatively obscure, but somewhat less obscure, these works. Uh, a lot of scholars now in my field know about them pretty well, but then the average person on this, and people in Belgium know about it. Like people in Belgium, it's this really normal for them. But the average person on the street, not in Belgium, don't know about these works of art. <laughs> and what they are, these altarpieces, they're they're pretty amazing. They're they're very large altarpieces that have normally they're large. They can some be small, but a lot of them are very large, which have sculpted wooden centers that are gilded and polychromed and paint, usually with very bright colors. And this is the sort of central section of them. And these are the wings. Sometimes, a lot of times the wings are painted. This one is pretty fancy, so it has sculpted wings as well. And this example is um, in the French version of the town is Salus. Uh, and this is when it's fully opened. And you can see here that here, these are hinges here. So you can fold these wings up and then you can, there are paintings once you've folded it up in this particular work. This is a particularly fancy one because it has a double set of wings and these are hinged here as well. You can fold it up another time and then you have this exterior completely folded up. Now, the way this works is most of the time it's completely folded up and you'd see this view. And then on certain feast days, perhaps the feast of St. Joseph, because this shows the life of St. Joseph, you would be opened up and you would see this particular scene. And then for the celebration of the mass, you would open it up all the way and you would see this particular side of it on when you would have a celebration of the mass. But as outside of the celebration of the mass, it would be all closed up. And these works were really actually produced in the thousands in the 15th and 16th century, primarily in Brussels and Antwerp. And um, they were the main form of decoration I've argued, and I think most people have agreed with me, um, on the high altars of churches in the lowlands uh, in the, uh, at this time in the 15th and 16th centuries. So we have this painting by Roger van der Weyden of the seven sacraments altarpiece, which shows the different 
sacraments being performed in the church and where you have the sacrament of the of the mass of the Eucharist uh, at the high altar in the church, it's being performed in front of a sculpted altarpiece. And so when we think of paintings as like the big thing, the main thing, actually the sculpted altarpieces are probably in fact, the most uh, and most common form of decoration on the high altar. And these Brussels and Antwerp uh, were really producers of these altarpieces and exporters of them, huge exports of them all over Europe. We know that they were exported north to Scandinavia, especially Sweden. There's, there's large numbers of them in Sweden. There's Denmark. There's even a few in Finland. They were also exported into Eastern Europe. There's a lot in Poland. There's a great number in Germany. There's, they're in France, they're in Italy. A large number were exported to Spain. We know from records of ships, that, that ships and tax records, that pretty much every ship that went from the for out of the port of Antwerp into Spain, it carried a carved altarpiece on it, and they were exported to Portugal. And so it was a very, uh, it was a really big luxury item that, for which um, Brussels and Antwerp were very well known and in which they, they made and exported throughout Europe. And so uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, quite a large number of them got destroyed with the rise of Protestantism. These were particularly big targets of attack and you could burn them very easily, they're made of wood. So a lot of them got destroyed, about 350 of them survived today. What I want to talk about today, first of all, is I want to look at um, the biblical narrative and two really wonderful uh, altarpieces, the Redible of Salus and one in Vreden, which is a, uh, in, in Germany. Then I want to talk about a kind of strange phenomenon that has been addressed and tried to explain about these works, that they're all the scenes, the biblical scenes are placed within so-called chapel spaces. We have German art historians to thank for naming this, the Kapellenschrein, um, which is that they're placed all placed within Gothic interiors, even when they should be situated outdoors, even when the scenes that technically took place outdoors, like the crucifixion, they're always shown as if they're taking place within a Gothic chapel space. And this makes for a beautiful appearance, aesthetic quality, but when you think about it, it ends up being a little bit strange. I want to talk about like why, why, why this talk more about uh, examine a little bit more, uh, show a little this talk more about this phenomenon. Then I want to try to explain why this might have happened, and um, I want to try to give an exp explanation that I didn't have when I wrote my dissertation and my book, um, which. I think relates to some of the religious values in the period relating to interiority and meditation and contemplation. So that's what I wanna talk about tonight. But first let's have a look at them uh, and look through some of the narrative scenes that show up in them. And they're very famous for their narrative scenes. We'll look first at this work that I've just shown you already briefly. The altarpiece of the Virgin of Salus. Uh, um, this was made around uh, 1500 to 1510 uh, coming out of Brussels. And it was originally made for an Italian family uh, in the town of Saluzzo in Italy, which is in the Piedmont region of Northern Italy, but the Belgians refer to it as Salus. They got to give it a French name. So we'll just follow them. It's now in the Musée de la Ville in Brussels. And this shows uh, what is called the infancy cycle, that is the cycle of the life of the childhood of Christ. This is a very high quality commissioned work. A, a good number of these works were actually not made on commission, that is, they were put on the open market. That's something I worked on a lot. I'm not going to get into here, but this one was made on commission for uh, these patrons. So they went to the shop in Brussels and specifically ordered it, we think, because we see their shields here of the family here at the bottom uh, of the work. But this has starts out with um, 
a uh, the story of the life of the virgin's childhood and these particular scenes are, are not actually from scripture they're apocryphal they're legend that starts out with the presentation of the virgin mary as a child uh in the temple uh, by legend uh, as a child she spent her time in the temple in the in the jewish temple and here are the virgin's parents sending her off and she's being accompanied by an angel and she's going off into the temple and this is the Jewish high priest welcoming her into the temple and there this is what they think the high priest this some kind of weird kind of garb that they think the high priest would have worn um and here we see uh, this kind of strange uh, monkey-like form here. I think this is trying to sort of suggest sort of the imprisonment of the monkey. A monkey is often a symbol of lust and the idea that the virgin is protected from that. And so this is kind of this, this, this simian form here, kind of uh, uh, imprisoned down here. And you can see that one of the amazing things about these carved altar pieces is this tremendous wealth of detail and carved detail. This is what they're famous for. Um, and um, uh, you see all the garments and the details of the architecture that make these you know, incredibly charming uh, works of art. The next scene is also apocryphal, the marriage of the Virgin, um, Virgin Mary uh, getting married to Joseph. And here again, a marriage um, and uh, officiated by uh, the uh, a high priest wearing the same kind of garb and uh, parents there, also accompanied by some angels here uh, in this scene. Brussels um, is really famous for this particular type of decoration um, in which they sort of um, uh, have um, two layers of paint and then kind of scrape down to expose the decoration in the lower level. It's called scraffito, and this is. Um, what we're seeing here, but this also gilding and all these decorations, which is a, um, a very fine uh, quality here that we see in this particular scene. And then this scene here of the um, Annunciation um, and uh, where now we are getting into the actual um, um, uh, scripture, gospel scriptures, the angel Gabriel coming down to announce uh, to the virgin that she is pregnant, the angel Gabriel with his scepter. And we have this kind of ribbon here, so we call it a banderol. And the actual words that the angel says to Mary in Latin, Hail Mary, full of grace, uh, are written out uh, as the angel kind of swoops in uh, and to announce to Mary that she is pregnant. And this is kind of set in what would have been a very typical room, bedroom of the 15th, uh, well, early 16th century, where they have these kinds of um, bed curtains and, and um, they um, have a curtain sack where they would open it up at night and take it down. And the Virgin Mary has even a little kind of altar so here where she prays with candles and um, even a kind of altar piece on it, which is almost in the form of the Ten Commandments. And, uh, and so it's sort of like a kind of Jewish form of an altar piece here that's presented. Uh, and um, so she's sort of shown as sort of very devout in this way and the little candles. So all these very de details, tassels here, on the top of the bed that really shown here, um, very typical of, you can see the angel barefoot here, just all these very, um, very um, detailed renderings of this scene that really make it something, you know, that you could understand, you know, really appreciate all the tales, details of it that bring it to life. And then the next scene also, um, Biblical is the nativity scene uh, of the, the birth of Christ. Now, in this case, they've lost the Christ child. That particular element of the scene got, got, is missing. But this, we see the virgin and the angels uh, adoring the Christ child who would have been placed on the ground. This particular type of image 
of the Nativity is based on the vision of St. Bridget, a 14th century Swedish saint who had a vision uh, of the Nativity in which uh, the Christ child was placed on the ground and after after the birth and and the Virgin and um, and Joseph adored him. And so a lot of Northern Nativity scenes, the poor Christ child is stuck on the ground. Uh, and that's where you typically see them because that is a Bridgentine Nativity scene. And it's also, um, we have the shepherds popping in also to adore um, the Christ child, one of whom is um, playing the bagpipe, uh, which was a, um, an instrument often associated with peasants. Um, and you also see the ox and the ass uh, getting in on the action as well as some angels. And again, just all very, all these details of everyday life, which are very typical of these scenes that, you know, are, are being brought in to really fill out all these anecdotal details of the narrative. Um, of course, angels floating in from above. And then we have the circumcision and they're really circumcising there, uh, here in this particular scene. And uh, we have Mary and Joseph coming in as um, a Christ is being circumcised and then other attendants here um, as well. Um, and a lot of interest in costumes, fancy hairstyles, turbans uh, are very typical of um, these works. This particular, here we have um, this sort of pedestal resting on these lions, which will reference to the throne of Solomon, which uh, was on uh, lions. So there's references to the Old Testament. And then we have the adoration of the Magi, the three kings bringing gifts and coming to uh, worship uh, the, uh, the Christ child. And um, at this time, it, it was very, very common, the idea that the three Magi represented sort of the three main um, areas of the world. Uh, Asia, Africa, and Europe. They didn't really have a sense of the Americas much at this point. And so it was very common that one of the, um, that one magus would be a black magus because uh, to represent Africa. And so, um, although we already have the appearance of the black magus, even back to the 13th century, it becomes especially common in the 15th and 16th centuries in Northern art to really show one of the, one of the magi as an African. Um, and that, that's why you see a black magus here to represent this notion of coming from sort of the three main parts of the world, all of these areas coming to worship the Christ child and um, bringing the gifts of frankincense, gold and myrrh to him. And the virgin child here sitting on a throne and receiving them this uh, kind of cloth of honor behind them to show their importance here. And then the last scene here um, is the presentation of the temple, a uh, scene from Luke, second chapter, in which um, Christ is brought to the temple to be consecrated as the firstborn, also at the same time of the purification of the mother at um, 40 days after the birth as to be purified. Um, this event uh, also occurs where um, an old man, Simeon, recognizes Christ as the Messiah and also the prophetess, uh, old woman, a prophetess, Anna, uh, recognizes Christ as the Messiah. And this is taking place in the temple. And uh, here again, they're showing the temple and, and thinking about the temple, they think the temple, like the church, has got to have an altarpiece. Well, what should be on the altarpiece of, um, of the temple? What would they have? So they have the Akedah, the sacrifice of Isaac as the subject matter in, um, on, the, uh, on the altarpiece of the temple. Of course, in the temple didn't have altarpieces, but, but that they, they just couldn't conceive of that. <laughs> the church has has altar pieces, so that's what they thought. These, um, this guy, uh, this is Joseph. He's carrying the doves that would have were to be sacrificed at the temple as part of the purification of the vir of the virgin. So this is um, the kind of narrative that we see in the infancy cycles. 
um, in this altar piece. And you can see the details um, that, that we have in this work from Brussels. Now, Brussels was kind of the first area of production of all for altar pieces and um, in the later 15th century and early 16th century. In the early 16th century, the, the, the shift goes to Antwerp. And this is an example of an Antwerp altarpiece, which is in Germany and the town of Raiden in a church dedicated to St. George. And this and things get even more elaborate and more complicated and that much more narrative. Um, and this is an example of a passion altarpiece. Sometimes the passion and, and the infancy are the most common cycles. There are also ones dedicated to saints, um, but these are the most common. This one is a pure passion one. I'm not gonna show you all the scenes because it would take us on a long time, but I'll show you some of the scenes from this. This is um, the Last Supper. And you might wanna spend a little time thinking like, Okay, where is Judas? It's always interesting in the Last Supper. Like, it's where's Judas? Where's Judas? Interesting in this that seems like Mary Magdalene has shown up at the Last Supper. I'm not sure why she's there. She's really not supposed to be there. But if you're looking around, where's Judas? Where's Judas? Wow, here he is with the money bag. And this is Judas with the money bag. Also, what also distinguishes him is he has red hair, which is a very common way to depict Judas. And red hair, there's a lot of like discrimination against redheads. And that was like seen as like a, sort of a negative thing. Uh, and so he is here with his money bag. And you can see he's getting ready to skedaddle. He's getting out of there um, quick. So there is Judas in this last supper scene in Vreden. And here um, is the um, agony in the garden scene where Christ is praying in the garden the night before um, he's going to be arrested and he uh, his disciples are just sleeping it off, but he is experiencing this crisis of fear and loss of faith and about be about um, about um, uh, having to be crucified the next day and actually and this is an interesting part of the scene that he's just about to be uh, arrested because actually here is judas with the red hair coming in and the soldiers are entering the gate of the garden so the agony of the garden uh, garden is actually just about it's over he's just about to be arrested in this scene with judas coming in uh to betray him to the soldiers and this is the betrayal and Judas here with the red hair kissing him. That uh, was the sign that he said he would give to the Roman soldiers. The agreement when Judas was gonna betray him was the soldiers, they didn't know which one was Jesus from among him on the followers. So Judas said, this is the one, uh, the one that I kissed. That's the one that's, that's Jesus. That's the one that you're gonna arrest. So Judas again with the red hair is kissing. Christ. Um, this is another event uh, told in the Gospels that that Peter cuts off the ear of the um, of the servant of the high priest. Uh, this uh, he's getting ready to do that. Sometimes you see the ear coming off, but it's not happening here. And then the soldiers are coming in uh, to arrest Christ in this particular scene. And this is the um, the uh, flagellation. Uh, Christ being whipped on a column here is one of the whips uh, and there are other ones here tied to a column and whipped after he's been arrested. This is the crowning with thorns and we have some, some of the officials watching from a kind of balcony as they leverage the crown of thorn and they don't only, they don't only crown him with thorn, they make these bad faces at him and mock him. Uh, and so um, that's additional details of, of how he is um, being treated by the executioners. And then uh, this is Pilate, Christ before Pilate. Uh, here's Christ and Pilate with this very elaborate beard here. And this basin here is Pilate washing his hands in the basin. He's gonna wash his hands of the guilt of of putting Christ to death. And just again, all this you know, detail of their costumes and fancy boots and um, all the details are, are shown in these works. And then Christ 
carrying the cross with, um, this is Veronica, who's going to wipe the sweat off his brow. Um, this child's making things even worse by trumpeting and making all this noise uh, to make it even more unpleasant as he has to carry the cross uh, on the way to Calvary. And here, a very complicated crucifixion scene with, with all sorts of soldiers and horses and things going on uh, in this particular scene. You, normally, the crucifixion will be the central and most complicated scene. And this is the lamentation. It's actually not a biblical scene. This subject matter where Christ is taken down from the cross and it's called the lamentation. People lament over his or sadly over his death. The Virgin Mary, the, the Mary Magdalene and a bunch of other holy women. It's not actually text, a textual scene. It gets invented pretty much in the 14th century. That's very common in art. Uh, um, very powerful, sad scene. And um, the entombment, Christ placed into the tomb, into the sepulcher here. Um, this is the jar with the embalming oils in front. Mary Magdalene usually holds that. And then here, the resurrection. Uh, Christ coming out from the tomb, the soldiers guarding it. I've been talking to one of my colleagues, what are these weird heads in the tomb? Um, we've been discussing that. We think maybe it relates to Roman tombs where they actually had little heads, sculpted heads in the tomb that they're trying to show here. So um, you can see that there's a lot of narrative, obviously, and much detail and narrative. Uh, in these works. And what is very interesting is that fairly early on, we start to see a very notable feature that I mentioned that they develop this idea of situating the scenes and situating the figures within um, a kind of Gothic chapel-like space. Um, it starts around 1415, where we start to see in this work in Dortmund that the back walls start to see this Gothic, these Gothic decorative forms called tracery, which is what we see in the architecture window, Gothic architecture windows have this. The back wall starts to get this tracery. We start to get these forms here that form vaults, these like ceiling forms over the figures that start to look like the forms are set in little Gothic chapel spaces. Starts around this time, and then it kind of dies out for a while, but then around um, 1460, it comes back. And sorry, this is a terrible photo. I haven't been able to find a better one of it. But this is um, in uh, Ternant, and I think I have a little bit better views of it. But in these two side scenes, you start to see that they make it look like this is an interior scene here. It looks like kind of brickwork. And then it looks like a kind of Gothic type window. And then this is the sort of vault, uh, sort of ceiling, curved ceiling on top. And they even try to suggest that there's like guys looking in the window from a space outside uh, into this room where this is the lamentation, this is the entombment. All of this, which should have taken place outside, is like in a little room inside. And these guys are kind of looking in from outside. And this is as if it's taking place in a little chapel. Now in this particular work, the crucifixion still takes place outside and they paint this backdrop of the city of Jerusalem, the skyline behind it. So it sort of started, it's sort of not fully putting everything inside, but pretty soon thereafter, everything starts to take place inside in these chapels. So in this altarpiece, which is around 1470, everything is happening as if it's indoors. And you see the crucifixion here. Christ, there's little windows behind him. There's little vaulted ceilings above him. And here in the wall behind him, they stick a rock and a tree. So they stick the landscape inside on the back wall of a chapel. So rather than showing it outdoors, they just put the inside, the outdoor landscape inside the room. Um, and this just keeps happening. So we have all these scenes um, 
Well, the flagellation took place indoors, but this is the deposition Christ taken down from the cross, but it's it looks like it's taking place inside a church. And here, the crucifixion, there's a windows behind him, but there's a cityscape with rocks and a, the skyline of Jerusalem on the back wall of this chapel. And this is just becomes really standard. Um, you can see again, Christ carrying the cross. Well, this was supposed to be outside, but it's like in a room with windows, Christ taken down from the cross in a room with windows. Same here, the windows are behind Christ and the cityscape, you can see it a little better here. Here's Christ crucified in a, in a church-like space, but some rocks and the sea, the, the backdrop of Jerusalem is inside the chapel. And, we, and this is true for, for Raiden as well. The agony in the garden is inside a chapel and the cityscape of Jerusalem is inside that chapel, so too with the arrest of Christ, which is in the garden. So this is kind of weird if you think about it. And normally in painting, this does not happen. You do not see the crucifixion typically or the resurrection or any of this taking place in interior settings. This is something very specific to these altarpieces. Occasionally you do some, something like this when it's symbolic, you might, they stick a crucifixion in a church setting, it's a very symbolic. But normally, you know, in, a, in something that's trying to show a narrative like we see here, they don't show, they, they put it where it's supposed to happen. So, you know, this, this, you know, brought me to this question and I was trying to confront for a long time, you know, for decades, <laughs> I'm going like, why? Why? What is with this chapel space? You know, why do we have this? So that brought me to the, the meaning of the chapel space. And starting with the fact that, you know, we ultimately have to consider that it is odd to have these narrative scenes and all through these cycles and put these scenes, some of which took place outside in interiors. In my book, of course, I talked about this issue of how it does contribute to the aesthetics of the altarpiece, you know, adding to its lavish ornament and you know, contributes to the naturalism, uh, you know, it, it, it makes it beautiful. I mean, it's just beautiful to have all this ornament. It's, it's, it's gorgeous. Um, but I also talked about how it, you know, it helped with establish the illusion of depth because you create the sense of a room and you have to realize that the spaces, the depth of this space here is only about 10 to 15 inches. So it's a very narrow space. So the creating this ornament, creating the illusion of a room kind of gives much more of a feeling of spatial depth. I also talked about how having all this Gothic ornament links it into the spaces of the churches that they were in because those churches have the same kind of ornament. And so, you know, that also relates it to the spaces that they're in. And I also talked about the idea that, you know, putting it in a church-like space gave it a holy quality. And in particular, um, the church also a kind of eternal quality. And one of the things we have to realize at this time is that, People conceived of heaven, not like as kind of a bunch of clouds in the sky. And heaven was seen as a kind of church-like space. In this um, last judgment, I mean, you could see people going into heaven and they were kind of entering into a church. And so the space of the church was really seen as like entering into a kind of heaven on earth. So when you kind of situate these scenes, oops, uh, in church-like spaces, you're making them heavenly, you're making them etern eternal, you're giving them sacred meaning. And, you know, I think I was on the right track, and I think I had some good points for sure. But one of the things that I, I didn't think about that I think is also a critical role is that I think that another thing that situating these scenes in these chapel-like spaces is that 
they create this notion of interiority in the altarpiece and that they stimulate people to turn inward. And one, one of the things that was so important within religious values of this period was to meditate and to emotionally engage in personal prayer at the time. And we tend to think about altarpieces often always in connection with public liturgical performance of the mass. But we also have to realize that at this time, there was so much focus on inner prayer and meditation and contemplation, and what we call um, um, empathic devotion. That is really imagining yourself emotionally connecting with the life of Christ, um, and imagining yourself present at the different events of Christ's life, participating inwardly in his life um, and um, really feeling emotion, joy at his birth, sadness at the events of his suffering and, and really feeling as if you were there. And what I think the interior settings were a kind of cue to people in this time to start to meditate and start to inwardly feel like they are there at those scenes um, and to engage in contemplative practices when they see those scenes. And so the chapel settings could kind of trigger that kind of religious experience. Contemplative um, practices were certainly part of earlier Catholic religious experience, but this was something that really expanded in the late Middle Ages, especially among the laity. And there were all sorts of um, religious leaders, religious writings that were designed and religious movements that were designed to encourage people to um, engage in contemplative meditation and serial meditation on the events of Christ's life. And I think these artworks kind of participated in that. So we have writings like Ludwig, Ludwig of Saxony, um, who wrote um, things like, we too ought always by remembrance to keep his passion indelibly imprinted on our hearts. And indeed, whoever wholly fixes the eye of his mind on the mystery of the passions on all things concerning our Lord will thus by meditating be brought as it were into quite a new state. Everyone ought therefore to make himself present at every single point of our Lord's passion and forgetting all exterior cares and anxieties to persevere in fixing on it the eyes of his soul and apply it to the whole power of his mind. So the idea is to sort of, you know, internally go in and then make yourself present at these different events. And so putting these scenes into interior settings is a sort of idea to go inward and sort of yourself, put yourself present uh, in these settings. And this is also a time where this focus on interiority manifests itself in a focus now on silent prayer. Previously, the emphasis was on oral prayer. And this is a time when people start to talk about what they called prayer of the heart, which is what they called Sil uh, silent prayer. Uh, and they started to value that above spoken prayer. And so in manuscripts, we find what we call rubrics, which are instructions for prayer. And they start to emphasize inwardness as a desired state in which to offer one's prayers. And so there are manuscripts where they talk about how, how um, somebody like St. Francis would read the following prayers with great inwardness, and they would say, read this prayer with inwardness, and you will see our Lord in the flesh before, he, before you die. So there are these instructions to read certain prayers and make sure you read them with inwardness. Um, and then mystics uh, are emphasizing the union with God in terms of interior spaces. So they talk about how you should withdraw into the secret chamber of God uh, and uh, wait, knocking with desire as, a, as on the door of a friend until you're allowed to enter and be made blissful. The faculties with which he attempts to attain bliss are like chamberlains, which lead the soul into her highest point at the threshold of the chamber of the eternal king. These are the three doors that are opened by the Holy Spirit for the loving soul so as to allow it to contemplate and know part of the infinite treasure of God. 
So the experience of mystical union with God is not just an internal experience, but it's like an entrance into a room through a door. And one of the interesting things to think about is that the wings of the altar pieces, what we call them wings, but they were actually referred to as doors. So, um, so viewers of these altar pieces could really read the presentations of these narratives within chapel spaces um, in, in light of the need to sort of bring, you know, the meanings and feelings embedded in these um, scenes into their inner souls and hearts. And then we also have to realize that, of course, these interior scenes are on the interior of an altarpiece and they have to be opened up for them to see them. So there's this great sort of doubling of interiorization in these works. And, and the very illogic of having some of these scenes, well, especially with the crucifixion, it's so illogical to see it in an interior. That's just even more of a cue for these viewers to go in inside. And they would sort of recognize this, this illogic makes people realize that they have to move in, internally. Another thing people have thought, of, I thought about more is we have to realize that these scenes are miniaturized. Um, the figures here are not life size. Most of the most of the figures are about one to two feet tall. The scale of them is very small, and so miniaturization is something that kind of encourages intimacy um, more so than you would have with uh, kind of life sized figures. And that sort of in because you engage with something that's so smaller but very detailed, it kind of encourages you to um, sort of enter into this world in a much more um, kind of intense way. And many people have kind of associated and some people have talked about these in relation to the experience of a doll's house. We don't have any doll's houses from our period, but we do have 17th century doll's houses. And when you realize, of course, you're looking at these and you're engaging with these, but you realize the space is kind of too small, you can't enter into it, really. So you then realize that the way you can only, you want to engage with it because you want to play with it, like you want to play with a doll's house, but you can't because it's too small. And the only way you can do that, of course, is through going inwardly and imaginatively um, doing that um, through uh, inner meditation. So what I ended up concluding was an important part of the chapel space was that they make these works kind of powerful ways in which viewers can engage internally with biblical narratives. And where those are scholars who've worked in the these works are used to thinking about how and, and very used to the elaborate narratives, but and and enjoy seeing the range of narratives and the detail of them, but we need to focus more on how they help people engage emotionally with the scenes. Um, and with the different and how they help people engage and become present at the different events of Christ's life and participate emotionally uh, in Christ's uh, life, experiencing joy and sadness uh, along uh, with these various events. Um, and so what might seem to us as charming and fun details were meant to be powerful means of personal identification with these scriptural events. So I want to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions. And I want to thank particularly Professor Matt Cavalier, University of Toronto, and fabulous photographer who offered me his photographs of those altarpieces, um, which um, so you could really see them extremely well. Let's start by giving uh, Professor Jacobs a big hand. Thank you. <laughs>